poem for my father. If you really want this to be your last day on earth, on purpose, and there will be children who are yours and you will be leaving them permanently, please, before you go, taking away Mother Nature's chance to translate you properly, listen, right now with no doubts, head out, hire hardworking lovers of life who really need the money. They may be difficult to find, but they are worth it. Pay them well. They will build you the world's largest neon sign. If you don't have the money, steal it from someone who kills people with it. If you get busted, fuck it. It's not like you had better plans. Don't tell anyone what you're doing. You do not need to leave a note. The workers will hang your sign from the deepest edge of a Grand Canyon where you will wait until dawn in stillness for the low down fog. Now duck back into that. There will be a rocket pack. Pick it up. Put it on. Dry your eyes. Bend down. Feel around for the beaded metal pull string leading to the neon sign. Hold it in your hand. Say a thank you to anything. Run fast as you can for the canyon gravity. No last words. Just jump high up and out as you quick flip the switch to the booster pack. Pull the string to, the, to light the sign, open wide your ending life and hang on tight to the lifting because you may shoot up and outward as the neon writes its light through the night in cursive tubes of water slides hung high and bright on the canyon side says, don't worry kids, the moon will catch me. There will be a blast of fire in the eyes of the workers watching. Dust will spread out like a helicopter castle when it's landing, even though you're leaving. Your children will be below in awe of you, waiting and wondering, Dad, what are you doing? Jetpacks have parachutes. Power off. Fall into it. Fall any way you want to. Saving yourself is jarring. Look around on the way back down. You're not the only piece of patchwork birds can pull worms from. If I were the man in the moon and my eyes were a little bit better, I would barely be able to make out the words stretched across your parachute top, stitched by the lovers of life who are very good with signs like, don't worry, moon, the kids will catch me. When did you write that poem? Probably 20 years ago after, uh, is that true? Maybe about 20 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. It was a few years after my dad killed himself. Which brings us to our touchy subject yes. of the day. <laughs> you know what's great about this, um, this episode is, uh, I don't know anything about this part of your life. I don't know anything about your dad or dads. I don't know anything about your relationship with your, your dad. Um, so this is all going to be new for me. This is me hearing this for the first time. Some of this for me is, is well, John, I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about yours and the, and yeah. the impact yours had on you. So let's start with you. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Let's start with you. Tell us, uh, your story with your dad, your relationship with your dad. And then, um, him uh, ending his life Whew! also also uh, a really important piece um the impact that relationship has had on you so the impact is going to be the difficult thing to to uh hone in on mm -hmm. i think we talked about this once before the time the therapist asked me so what was the trauma couldn't point for me the trauma and i was like bitch it was the whole thing <laughs> It was never not there. And so when we talk about the impact, I think it's just one blunt force that's sort of been acknowledged or not acknowledged the entire walk. Um, so my so let's, folks... Let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's start at the shallow end of the pool and just say something real quick before you get into this because it, it is okay. it is the heavy. Um, I just want to announce, I know it's obvious, but uh, we are using a new platform today. And we're doing this because... Yes. Um, 
our podcast is evolving. And with, uh, um, you know, us showing up, I also want there to be better sound. And so hopefully if you're listening to this, uh, you are not cringing, you are not taking your earbuds out, but uh, we, 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 we sound like uh, silk. We are okay in your ears. We started off on Zoom and then we did podcasts on Instagram Live, um, which may not have been a good idea. And now we're on this uh, Riverside platform and uh, someone in the chat says, you sound good without headphones. And so um, Buddy is in Portugal and he lives in this giant castle. So there has always been this huge echo. Um, and then he also has really bad Wi-Fi. If you're watching this, you can see he looks like he looks like Max Head. He looks like Max Headroom from the '80s. He's very pixelated, but that's okay. Uh, Ethan says it's very smooth. Thank you so much. I feel so Listen. good that that people are now. Uh, they're like, dude, the sound is good. So this is great because. And also, I want to say, buddy, um, I don't want to discredit your poems because. Uh, your poems are so good, and your 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 words are like you know art. And so to have poor sound breaks my heart, and that's why we are upgrading today. John, I'm so excited about all these technological advances that are going to make us more quality people. I was curious about looking at you right now. You're pixelated, and I'm clear as day. So <laughs> we should work that out later. I'm not kidding. So I think it's having an opportunity. That has nothing to do with the platform. Your eyes are going bad. You need glasses. Um, no, but, and, 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 okay. And, and we're we're not upgrading as people. As people, we're we're still uh, defective. Uh, we're upgrading the the technology, buddy. That's on us. Okay, that's well. I think you should speak for yourself because I'm currently in the twelve step programming. And I'm pretty sure I get to be a better person when it's over. My favorite part about it so far is that I'm guaranteed to be less, less self obsessed. Mm, that's something I need to work on. Hey, uh, okay, now let's talk about your dad and we'll talk about mine. Okay, this is big. I don't know where to, here we go. That's You're just like throwing me out into the arena. And like, okay, just talk about your dad. Keep him busy. Here's the deal. <laughs> Here's the I, deal. I, My, I parents were married to each other. My parents were married to each other first. So it was it was them and, and me. Mom was a virgin. This isn't about mom. Hold on. But I did just give her some serious uh, Christian cred. So, <laughs> so mom and dad first had me. By the time I was in ninth grade, they were each married four times. Wow. In there, technically seven, but mom's third was the worst. So I definitely count him as an official because we lived with him for two years. And he was just, oh, my God, he was a horrible. He was a horrible creature. Kent Wood, if you're listening, I hope your mean heart has stopped hurting and you're better to people. Mm. Uh, here's the deal. So how, I didn't how, see how my was father. He, how was he horrible to you? In what way? This is Kent Wood. This is the third one. Are we yeah, okay. third, Kent, three, how was Kent three. horrible to me? Really? Live? Well, I remember getting beat up in the kitchen one time for going to the movies with Kervin Kagan, who was a black kid. Mm. Okay. Got it. Is that's, let's go back to my dad now. <laughs> so, so... Uh, 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 my mom's second husband adopted me when I was five. Um, my, so I was, this is actually in a poem of mine that I was, uh, I was born Kenneth Zane Beasley, the third, my dad was Kenneth Zane Beasley jr. Mm -hmm. And at age five, I was adopted by a truck driver. And because my nickname had always been buddy, they just made it legal. And they gave me his middle and last name, which was Marshall Stevens. So I became buddy Marshall Stevens mm -hmm. during that time. I didn't, so I stopped seeing my father because I was born in Louisiana, fattest baby ever born in my hospital. And so my cousin Zane, who was one ounce heavier, I still have a problem with that. Um, so we moved from the South to New York with my mom's second husband. We were in upstate New York near Niagara Falls in a little village called Sanborn. Now, um, uh, uh, so I didn't see my dad for eight years. Uh, and then the church of the Latter-day Saints, this is hilarious or not. The church of the Latter-day Saints had these commercials on and, uh, uh, and they were, they were giving out free games. And all I saw as a kid was free game, dude. <laughs> and I was like, mom, you gotta call the number. <laughs> it's a free game. And so, but it was basically like, you know, walking the path with, with, uh, who's the main dude, Joseph Campbell. I don't know. That's not true. And anyways, the latter, the Mormons sent a game and my mom and I played it. And it was these questions that explored uh, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Smith. Smith. Yeah. 
Yeah. Joseph, jo- Joseph Campbell. Uh, Joseph Campbell created the hero's journey. That's a that's a yeah. Guy. Thank you. He was a good guy. Huge distinction. <laughs> So, so the Mormons sent a game and it was, and it was, it was an introspective thing that, you know, like you stopped on, it was like a candy land marker. And then you had to answer this question and somewhere in there, my father came up and my mom and I started crying and my mom was like, well, do you want to see him? Cause it was the first time she realized, you know, it's eight years and the kids never met his dad. And I've just assumed that this truck driver who's never there is going to be fine for him. (laughs) So, so I saw my dad after uh, eight years, I don't remember exactly what age I was, but I went down to Louisiana. We were down in Louisiana and I saw him and uh, I was just, I was a kid. I've always been a puppy dog, a kid, you know, like I'm forgiving, walk in the door and I'm wagging my tail. I don't care what you, how long you left me alone here. Mm -hmm. I'm just happy to see you. It's my dad. Right. So, and he was a cop. How cool is that? And he was the youngest, he was the youngest um, captain of the police force in Natchitoches, Louisiana that had ever been. And uh, so, you know, I had all these great things in my head about him and I heard all these stories uh, except some that my mom told me, <laughs> but like about pawning her high school class ring for six bucks so she could feed me because he took all the money. But anyways, so, so, uh, I, it was a big deal to me, this guy. Um, it turns out, so then he became a Texas Ranger. His whole life he was a police officer from the time he was 19 years old forward. He became a Texas Ranger. He was really high up in the police force. He was in the Houston, uh, he was in Houston PD. Um, when he died and here's what happened was that he had a bachelor's, uh, a master's and a PhD in criminal justice. Wow. He had actually never gone to a day of college in his life. No one knew that they found out through some sort of paper, accidental paper trail that this was true. And he was about to be in a whole lot of trouble, possibly even uh, prison for everything that had happened alongside this. Wait, which would have been so the letters after his name were forged. He made them up. Everything was forged. So he had never been to college a day in his life and he had a Ph.D. Right. right. So uh, and I think it was to Sam Houston University, which is where I went. And I was always bummed because he never came to see me when he was there. You know, it was this he he uh, he died three months before I graduated college. So. um, So he uh, he found, you know, this was this was a, a. Found out, and in, in I think the same day, the next day, he he went into the garage and did the whole garage style thing, turning on the car engine and stuff. And then he theatrically laid himself out on the ground as though he were reaching for the doorknob uh, just before he died, which is just typical of. I mean, it's in my mind, it's like they said he tried to get out, and in my mind, I was like, that is not true <laughs> because his whole life was a pathological lie. And here's where it gets worse and more unbelievable. Um, in fact, so unbelievable that my face turns pitch red when I'm retelling certain stories because I know people think I'm lying Mm -hmm. and I don't want to, I don't want it to be like father, like son, because I'm not. But the reality is most of my high school believed that my father wrote Garth, many of Garth Brooks songs. Um, Garth Brooks had a, had a songwriter named Kent Blasey who wrote if tomorrow never comes and a number of his other hits as well as, mm-hmm. as well as writing for other people. And I think that was Dwight Yoakam and Vince Gill, a lot of people. And you have to remember, I was in the rodeo at one point and I was in Texas and, uh, we were raised on country music. So this is a huge deal. It's Garth fucking Brooks. Right. So, and my dad didn't live with us and he had a nice size home in humble Texas. He's also an amazing guitar player and country songwriter, seven notebooks, huge, full of country songs. Mm. There was no reason to not believe him. Right. And I wasn't with them to, you know, check things out. I was just told, you know, get ready. Dwight Yoakam's coming over for dinner next week. Oh, Dwight canceled. He had to do something on tour, but this was ongoing for, for a couple of years. And uh, so when he died, I think it wasn't long after that. Uh, I mean, when he died and the reason he died, we all started to question everything. And then uh, my sister, my, I have a half sister from him, Sandy Beasley, who I've never had a ill word with in my life. She's a wonderful woman. And, um, and so she called to say, Hey, I, uh, I mean, this is before Google. So she said, I just saw Kent Blasey on country music television. Uh, doing an interview on a talk show and it and it wasn't dad heads up <laughs> mm, right. so he was a pathological liar he was a uh, the, th- the only good memory i have i have a couple of good memories of him uh, 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 uh that i could talk about uh if we get more and more specific largely around food 
I, I know he had a great sense of humor. I, I, and then one time I was meditating, I would just like to say this before we smooth out of this. I, I, I was meditating at a Vipassana course one time and, um, and I could, and I, if you know how some people joke that they were adopted by somebody else because both their parents have black hair and they've got blonde hair, you know, some weird, somebody's always making that joke. And the truth is I have never been more 50, 50. I'm only 50, 50 of these two people, my mom and my father. Mm -hmm. And it is so 100% clear. There's zero doubts, their behaviors, their attitudes, genetics are real. His anger. I was, I wasn't around him to witness his anger, mm -hmm. but I know it. Uh, I know, I know it by the way it's explained. And I know the few times I had glimpses into it, the walk of my mother, like 50, 50 in meditation. I just realized I was 50, 50, these two human beings. And, uh, there was, there was such a, a love and compassion for what they must've had to go through. Um, and I know when he died, uh, when, when we were at the funeral, uh, and this is where shit gets really touchy subject for me because it's about an exposure for me. I, I so did not have a, lo a strong love connection with my dad. And I was more interested when he died because I knew I was about to sp uh, fail Spanish four in my last semester of college. Mm -hmm. I was more interested in seeing how far I could milk his death in order to make sure I graduated. So that's, that's, that's a little bit about, uh, how much I really cared now years as the years went on, was I concerned like, wow, what am I, what am I repressing? Uh, have I not dealt with something, but I'm 48 now and you know me to be an open book. And I just don't think I ever was entangled with him yeah. enough to like, there's, there's moments, there's moments, uh, you know, where you and I met at mindset. I, I, I there was a, there was this chubby, fat, roly poly, young Mexican boy. He couldn't have been more than four years old. And I was doing a plank and I was looking out that garage do open door and he was running along Los Feliz Boulevard and he just came out of nowhere in front of the CrossFit and, and he's giggling his ass off. And it was the sweetest fucking cutest thing you can imagine. And all of a sudden this man swoops in and lifts this portly little kid up into the air and he's jogging him around with his arms and the kid is just giggling, laughing. And I was laughing and it was the sweetest thing ever. And in my mind, I knew in the split moment, oh, that never even happened once yeah. for me. Yeah. And that's the times when I, when, when I think, oh, maybe that's why I can't entangle because it's so deep that it's shallow. You know what I mean? Like I just can't even get involved with not having had him. So, yeah, man, um, we live in a fatherless nation and I know this because for five years I worked in nonprofit, uh, helping teenage addicts and the, uh, boys either wanted to be me or fight me and all the girls were standing too close. I knew all their parents and dad wasn't there. So either dad was not there emotionally, right? He was in the back room eating donuts because he had to attend meetings and stuff or um, there was no dad, only moms. And so when I realized this, I started to think about my own life and uh, my dad was always at work. There, there were no uh, camping trips. This is why when you know we talk about how would I do on that show alone, um, I, 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 would, I would tap out you know, a few hours in because um, <laughs> my dad never took me camping. There was no fishing trips. I was raised by pop culture, man. I was raised by going outside and riding my skateboard until it got dark. I was raised by, you know, the friends, the kids in the neighborhood. And, and so dad was never around. He was also, um, I think he was bipolar. I, he was either on cloud nine, thought we won the lottery or, and, and fun and grateful and always the life of the party. Or he was um, living in dread and worry. And then he would, you know, um, translate that energy onto us. And so uh, he, he's not with us. He, he's, he's passed, but um I wonder um, who I would be today or how different I would be today uh, if he was more in my life as in more present, more like the uh, like the, 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 the chubby Hispanic kid who got scooped up by his father and they were having that moment. Um, how do you think, how do you mind. think, how do you think, because in all of your endeavors, John, you've been pretty successful since I've known you. How do you think specifically you've seen that being around him has um, 
uh, contributed to that? And where do you find that you feel held back from? I guess you just answered that in the camping statement. <laughs> that, that's one. Uh, uh, yeah, there were some there were some great things uh, 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 from I learned from him. Uh, you know, he came to America with five hundred dollars and two children, and uh, he he worked a lot. He was an alcoholic. Uh, what I took from him was uh, he was always about risk. There was no bad idea. Even if, you know, a 10 year old kid, his son came up with an idea to turn, you know, the uh, house into a, a, a roller coaster amusement park by um, letting the, the, the kids ride the, the big skateboard and charging $3 or whatever idea that I had, he was always um, pro, always encouraging. And I think because I think he felt like this is what America is. You come to America and you believe in something, and this is what being an American means: is to, uh, you know, have ideas and, and execute. So that I really he risked a lot. Uh, a lot of the risks he lost a lot of money and stuff. But as far as ideas and and hey, Dad, what if we you know sold this at you know our restaurant or whatever our family business was at the time? Uh, he never poo pooed it. So that I really admired. Uh, and also he was inappropriate in um he's the kind of dad that would like fart and blame it on mom and stuff in front of the kids so he he was inappropriate in kind of a um a fun way and and I'm definitely you know dry inappropriate uh, a lot of times people question if I'm a real therapist like who are you and and I get get all that from my dad um other than that the other stuff has been you know uh the addiction gene right so I get that from my dad and mm. um impulsiveness um mm. the the up and down i don't know if you're like this but i'm also either gratitude cloud nine i can't believe my life or <laughs> what's what's the point of any of this you know that kind of thing i i, I can't yeah, man. i move over in extremes and i don't know if that's an addiction thing um, but that, that was definitely passed down from my dad there's an all or nothing about that there's yes. definitely an all or nothing about that that's got we got to be feeling everything or just taking it you know get purging our mind of everything. I know there was a time living in Los Angeles where I might as well have been hanging out the window, like a musical, like sound of music, just was singing mm -hmm. to Los Angeles from those fearless windows. And then, and then there were days I couldn't leave weeks. I couldn't leave the apartment. Do you, do you and think that, I know, that if you got the emotional milk that you didn't from your dad, if your dad did spend time with you and put uh, you on his shoulders and took you camping and all that shit, um, do you think you'd be yes. different today? Really? One hundred percent. Your personality wouldn't be different. I mean, you still would be, you know. But but, um, how would you be different? In what way? I genuinely believe I would be a, a a massively different person. Like in the movie right now, John, when they switch me up to the what if I had had that father, I do believe you probably would. Neither of us would recognize me. You have to keep in mind that the, the, the mindset of my family. And, um, uh, I mean, there's just so many variables. Of course, it's like the butterfly flaps its wings sure. in Argentina and causes sure. a, a, a hurricane somewhere else. I know that that would be the case. And, um, I believe equally in nurture as I do nature. I think they serve, they both serve an equal part in the sphere. Um, so who knows to what degree I would have overcompensated as a gay man to who knows how much I would have accepted that. Right. Um, there's a there, there's so much to, to, to have you know safety now is something extremely important to me because I've, I never experienced this stuff and I and I know from observation and from moments in my life that that uh, what, what even a moment of safety how that can alter someone's someone's path and to have experienced safety and security the whole way wow not to say that he would have provided that because from the stories I don't know that he could have anyways. Um, well, but at least emotional safety, at least knowing that you have someone there. That um, somebody had my back. Yeah. And that he, and, you know, like, it, I mean, and it was a cop. So, like, no matter how terrible or shitty of a cop he actually was, uh, you know, I would have had a certain amount of information with a certain amount of narrative from society and a certain amount of safety that went along with that. A father, a cop, protected, all that. Somebody having your back because these days all you care about is someone having your front. My, 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 my cousin Lacey, my cousin Lacey said it best because her father was also missing. Uh, my cousin Damon's father was also missing. There was, 
but and there were a lot of stepdads along the way from everybody's there were there were three sisters and all of us cousins my mom and her two sisters and sorry Lacey said to me one day on the phone to put it all in perspective when I was in my early 40s and it sort there was sort of a relief it was such a witness she said hey buddy no man ever came no man ever came there was none there. there weren't any there for us. No one ever swooped in and saved the right, day. Right. They they were rotating like the seasons. Were all were yeah. all your step uh uh dad slash uh boyfriends uh, were they all abusive or just that one? So my mom has now been with her fourth for uh 32 years September 9th, I believe. He's a great guy. His uh his name's David and uh I've known him since the ninth grade. Wasn't a big fan at first because it was just another one to me. So in their wedding photo, I just looked like a fucking asshole. And <laughs> I got the shittiest possible haircut I could right before. But but he's he he's a good guy. He's a good guy. In fact, when I moved to LA, you know, he's a he's a really soft spoken guy. He doesn't say a lot. He's a hard worker. And uh you know, it's not like I've, I've never actually talked to the guy on the phone much mm -hmm. unless there was a, a, an essential. And this is 32 years later. But I do know when I moved to L.A., that man did something. <laughs> that he sent me a check for two thousand dollars in a handwritten letter mm -hmm. that said, now you're where you're supposed to be. I've always known this. And this is like a guy who worked for Monsanto. This is l literally a, a, a guy from. South Houston, who's always worked plants. And when I went to, when I moved to Los Angeles, that dude said, this is where you're supposed to be. Wow. Yeah. That feels like, um, amazing, amazing. I mean, especially, uh, coming from, you know, uh, a, a, a quote unquote dad. Right. And, um, you know what I'm jealous of and what I, what I miss is when I see friends who, um, have awesome dads the dads that uh, were there and mm -hmm. as an adult they could like go somewhere and have um, deeper conversations about life and meaning mm -hmm. and all that man i've never had that i can't even imagine that uh partly because you know i speak broken korean my my parents uh uh, uh my my mom speaks broken english and so we can say pass the ketchup. We can say, you know, how much did we sell today and stuff like that. But we can't have any any kind of deep conversations. Um, so I get really wow. jealous. Now, wow. I wonder, I wonder what it would be like. And, and I've, I've always craved that when I was married, um, her dad was like my dad in that we could sit down and talk about motorcycles and Harleys. And, and I was like, fuck, this feels amazing. And there's something that uh, as a man, a dad gives you that mom can't. You know, yeah, and uh, yeah, dude, I, I craved it. I, of course, I think we all do. I and think I think it caused, it caused a lot of jealousy. It caused, yeah, and and mom, mom did her best. Sure. She certainly did her best, and especially in that southern style upbringing, where like there was no dad to correct me. So I think she swung the belt twice as hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like there was, there was that. I also um. I wrote something on Twitter last night and I didn't post it because it was out of context. And over here in Porto, I don't get to see, I don't, I don't pay attention to the news over there as much. And so there'll be, sometimes things will be happening like a school shooting and I don't find out until a day or two later. Yeah. And so I didn't post anything on, post this on Twitter when I wrote it yesterday. It was just a random thought I was having. Um, and it was around the subject uh, and, and, and how I was going to balance out talking about it. Um, but uh, I've always tried to avoid this when talking about my dad, except uh -oh, it's help me out here. I can't tell if that is milk overreaction or actual pain. <laughs> I've always just wanted to make sure that whatever pain there was from it, I was, I, I could sort through it. And the only time I ever actually, and this is why there's such guilt around his, him, him dying, is when I went into Dr. Gerling's class and said, my dad just killed himself. And Dr. Gerling was like, dude, it's not your fault. He gave me a big hug. He was, it was just yeah. the sweetest thing ever. But the truth was, I was about to not graduate college because of Spanish 4, which I was being forced to take mm -hmm. as an English major. So I've always tried to draw a distinction with... Uh, 
I don't think I've ever milked my, I don't think I've ever milked not having a dad. I think I've really just been legitimately bummed about it. Yeah. Tell me, has that ever come up for you? The idea of guilt around it, around. So this is interesting because uh, I've passed on going to um, uh, my dad's uh, gravestone with my brother and family. Uh, once a year we go there and I keep pushing it off. I, I, I put it very low on my importance list. And uh, what's, what's, and I don't know what, 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 what that is. Like, it's not that I'm mad at him, but um, maybe it's a uh, it's subconscious. Um, or because I didn't have much of a relationship. I didn't respect him, all of that stuff. Um, by the way, my dad was Bruce Lee. I don't know if you know this. That's not true. Yeah, I'm sorry. I am, you know, buddy, I almost, I almost said Jackie Chan, but then it's like that was like our last episode, and and that's the knee jerk uh, <laughs> from the locker room. <laughs> hey, can I just say something real quick about Jackie Chan? Um, yes. When, when I was when I was married, my 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 ex, um, her mom said not in a racist way. She was just being serious. She said, "Hey, John, you you kind of resemble Jackie Chan." And uh, since then, I fucking hate when people call me Jackie Chan. And don't laugh, buddy. And I'm no, I'm just listening like, because I know well, that I, I, I know. Also, that right. I also feel like because I kind of agree. There's some angles I do kind of look, look like Jackie Chan, the fat nose, whatever. But but here's the thing: um, if you're gonna call me Jackie Chan, just give me Bruce Lee. Just give me Bruce Lee, man, because Bruce Lee was a legend. I mean, not that Jackie Chan isn't. You know, he's very talented and all that, but. Uh, Anyway, wait, okay, wait, pause. Pause. We, yes. we can come back to this in a second. Just real quick. Fun, fun, fun moments of the show. Who would win in a fight between Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan? Because Jackie Chan's not going to go out like a bitch. No, he was very, yeah, he does all the stunts. And I, I, I don't know. Bruce Lee, Blue, Bruce Lee was a tiny guy. He was like, a, I think, a, you know, a buck 25 and very, you know, I think he was very fast, um, but I don't think he would. I don't think he's someone that would win at a, a, a you know in a street fight. Um, anyway, at my dad's uh, funeral, Pete was there. Um, I stood up and read something, and dude, I never cried so hard. I started bawling for some reason. I just started bawling. I I didn't think it was that big of a deal, and I was just reading, you know, him coming to America, what I took from him and stuff, and. Dude, I just started bawling, bawling like 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 un- I can't even speak. And I remember seeing Pete in the front row, and I was crying so hard that that just I think just just seeing me cry that hard, Pete almost started crying, and he always, like started looking down and stuff. And um, I'm mad at Pete for not actually crying. Actually, it's the one thing I hold against him. I, I almost made him cry, but. <laughs> Um, so that's like, <laughs> you know, made Pete show emotion. Exactly. That's like proof that some that there's something there um, that maybe I'm not aware of uh, with my father, uh, and also now as a 49 year old with a two year old daughter, man, I can't imagine her. Who, by the way, you're going to get to give her all these things. No, I, yeah. Well, that's why it's important to me. And every time I, if every time I'm not present, every time I am thinking about lunch or playing with my phone when I'm with her. You know, I get, I get, I get mad at myself, but, um, dude, I can't imagine her growing up without a dad. I can't imagine her, um, being abused by stepdads and, um, not having safety or a positive male role model, uh, model in her life. And yet that's most people that's yeah. not, that's like the norm, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it wires yeah. us a certain way. We gravitate toward um, dysfunctional relationships, uh, different types of people who may be toxic because of this unsafety. Uh, I wanted it. I wanted it, man. Yeah. I really did. I, uh, I'm. What I did was become extremely good at navigating suffering and tragedy. I became a tragedy addict. I became really good at navigating trauma. And, uh, and and I, people love to do what they're good at. So I, I, I created more of it for myself along the way without understanding that that's what I was doing. I think a lot of people do that as tragedy addicts. And uh, um, and so now at 48, I am just now really uh, coming out of, you know, there was a period when I had thought I'd come out of the spin and then realized there's a, still 
a, a lot in there I've not dealt with. And, you know, it's a yeah. process, not an event. So it's always going to be happening in some regard. Um, I'm just happy to be at a place now where I'm no longer interested in the tragic trauma aspect sure. of it, but giving my attention to where the joy actually pops its head through and going toward that face, which is something that I do believe a good father and a good mother guide the way to from the get go where possible. Yeah. Hey, do you gravitate toward uh, father like figures? Do you gravitate toward, um, and it doesn't have to be like older men, but men that uh, um, give you that kind of um, emotional milk or, um, you know, in some way, I'm not, I'm not saying like as, yeah, a, yeah. as a partner, I'm just saying in general in life as friends. I mean, you're talking to a gay guy, so there's so many innuendos that just got used there by accident in a serious conversation. So I, need to... I, I, also, I also said a joke at a very inappropriate time. You missed it. You said that your dad had, or you, you wanted someone to have your back or something. And I said, yeah, these days all you care about is someone having your front. And it's yeah, very inappropriate. Yeah. And yeah, I think you heard it, but you're like, John, not now. But that, yeah, I, got well, that. I wasn't, I entire, I wasn't entirely sure. Uh, but here, wait, here, do I gravitate? So here's the thing I can say yes and put this all on myself. Yes, I gravitate toward uh, father, fatherly figures. Of, but he, listen, here's the deal. Uh, people gravitate to stability and safety and security and yeah. routine who are living in chaos, who have always been living in chaos. Right. They gravitate to that stuff. So why do you think so many people gravitate toward Pete, who doesn't say one-tenth of the words you and I do in this world? People gravitate to Pete because he's holding it down. Pete also had a fucking incredible father who he loves with structure yeah. and routine. Yeah. And, yeah. and so people gravitate to Pete because Pete, unlike us who are good at navigating trauma and suffering, Pete is really good at navigating that which makes us healthy, that which makes a healthy body and mind. So, of course, we're going to gravitate to that. Now, do some fatherly figures pose as Pete's? Yeah, a lot of them, and that's why we get so disappointed. And then we start getting into relationships and daddy issues and all of that stuff. But do I gravitate toward father figures? Yeah, I do. Uh, not. Uh, oh my god! By the way, I'm more of an I, uncle. I'm more of an uncle. I, right, right. I'm a fucking cool uncle, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a substitute teacher, man. Just don't put me in that class the whole semester. Let me go. Let me go in and let me go in and make them better for a week or two. That's what I'm good for. Um, oh, I forgot my my line of thought and going. Um, we in we that also direction. we also um, had to parent ourselves because our our parents uh, were either busy at work or just weren't there uh, emotionally. Yeah, you know, a dude a dude one time uh, a good friend of mine one time said uh, I was really we were in a tour van and I was I mean I was living in the van with six people for four months and. Uh, and I just kept losing my cool. I really, and I couldn't hide it. It was penetrating. And despite the fact that I don't think he knew my chemistry enough to know that I couldn't necessarily hide it uh, when it was that intense and overwhelming. I'm not good at being overwhelmed. Um, but I remember, no matter what the context was, I remember he said, man, dude, I just really wish sometimes you would father yourself. Like, you really let yourself go, go out there. Yeah. And I remember thinking, A, fuck you, and B, that's fantastic advice. Yeah. And I held on to it. In fact, most of the times I was ever mad, I had a Dutch partner for two years named Raymond Leasting. Incredible man. Incredible gentleman. And I remember... Every time that dude called me out on something, which was fairly often and in shitty ways because the Dutch translation is so literal, <laughs> there was no mincing words. And I remember every time I'd get mad at that dude, it, it would take me a week and then it would or hours or days or a week. But I, would, I think I was so mad because I knew he was right. And I was going to at some point have to admit it because he was such a stable, grounded guy. Yeah. And I was still so embarrassed after all these years for being a fucking train wreck. I mean, I'm still, there's still days. I mean, we know from the beginning of how this podcast started. There are sure. still huge moments where the spin outs is real and I'm so but, bummed. But he's not talking to... about this episode. He's talking about when we first started this podcast. When we first started this podcast, I may or may not have been relapsing and doing shows high. 
<laughs> and not just like high on weed either. <laughs> right. We, that we, I could have uh, handled. Most of us, uh, people in the room, people listening, have had to reparent uh, or continue to, to parent ourselves. Most of us, uh, no adult, no child enters adulthood unscarred. We've all had trauma in some lives. No parents are perfect. I know how hard it is to be a parent just in the last two years. Um, and before we get to our revelations, I, I do want to say uh, uh, any parent listening to this, uh, if you're present and you're trying, I just want to applaud you. It's fucking You're doing crazy. great. You're doing great. You're doing great. You can't do it wrong. That, something our friend CJ told me one time, John. Mm. Uh, John and I have a mutual friend named CJ uh, Levens, and she said, she said, you just can't do it wrong. You can't do it wrong. We're here to experience it. And if you think it is something other than the it that you've got going on, you're missing the point. You can't do it wrong. You are here to experience it. So the answer is always, oh, of course. Of course this is happening this way. Of yeah. course look at my reaction because of this. You can't do it wrong. Of course. Ethan, thank you for your kind words. You just uh, said these episodes keep getting better and better. Thank you for the space. Um, Buddy and I are late bloomers. So, yeah, it's going to take a few episodes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I want to I end with this story before we do it. <laughs> I, I want to end with this story about being a late bloomer uh, before it, 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 we can do revelations, if, if you want to, of the week. But I want to say that I was in a, I was in a psychology class in college, and uh, it was one of the more memorable classes I had. The guy was fantastic. I wish I could remember his name, but he was talking about this study basically loosely where it's people, people who mature at a younger age – tend to sort of level out and not continue growing because they're so reaffirmed in their maturity at a young age. Uh, and then people who uh, are really immature and, 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 and uh, their peers matured a long time before them because of their want to be part of the pack or whatever the reason may be. I don't want to throw too many extra words in there, but they don't actually, people who mature later don't actually stop maturing. There's no like off button or, Right. So I remember, I remember being in that class and knowing that that resonated with me, that so many of my friends were already these confident, level-headed folks and that I was, just a, I was just a piece of chaos, that I was just a charged molecule bouncing the fuck around. And, and I remember he said that in, in my brain, like it was victory arms. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be mature someday. <laughs> I'm into it, man. <laughs> You know, but yeah, I, that, that word mature is also loaded because I think one of the problems of the world is that we put so much weight on being an adult that we forget to connect to our childlike wonder, right? So I think there is a there is a balance there. Um, I'm almost fifty, and just finally in my life, I start. I'm finally feeling like a kind of an adult, you know, being responsible. With good hair, with sense. great hair. With uh, my hair is grown out, even though I do have a merm, and uh, 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 responding instead of reacting, and um, paying bills on time, that kind of shit. That's just all happening now, and I'm fucking 49. I did my first squat at 35 years old, but uh, you know what? I would I would rather be a late bloomer and uh, cash in on the quality of life and see life in color now than if I was in my 20s, because if I was in my 20s, I would have been so – I wouldn't even know what to do with it. If life was in color and I had security and money and shit in my 20s, I I don't even know if I'd be Oh, good I'd night. Be somewhere. Yeah, good, good night. night if I had had money in my 20s. Buddy and I are meant to um, – we're, Buddy and I are meant to find the coins throughout the rainbow and not all at the end because we couldn't handle that shit. We, my, we, we my, need our gold coins sprinkled. <laughs> we need an allowance, basically. <laughs> this is this is the lesson my physiotherapist here in Porto, Gonzalo, who's my favorite person in Porto, by the way. He's got that gangster C in the middle of his name. Gonzalo, he, uh, he's 25 years old. He's like a Doogie Howser, and I was, mm -hmm. I was, I was crying on the table one day let's blame it on the fact that he hit the wrong pressure point but <laughs> but i was i was just having a rough time gonzalo i you know the thing is fixed that he started working on last year i just go because he because he's he's a, 
it's physiotherapy and, and, and actual therapy at the same time. Yeah. And, and this kid is brilliant. Uh, he's love. He's just, when you walk in a room, he's love and everybody's safe. And, uh, you know, he's put five foot five and it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is that this 25 year old kid looks at me like a father and says, well, you're ahead of your destiny. You, and this, this is relative to the gold coin statement that you're making. I'm, I've, I've always been like, listen, dude, I know there's a pot of gold at the end. That's where I want to be. And I don't want to fuck around. But what you're saying and the truth is that's getting ahead of my destiny when yeah. all the coins are along the way. And yes. it has never been more important to me, John Kim. You know, the now is, is, an, is, is a subject that's been exhausted from the beginning of time and also the most amped. Uh, the most, subject to be most amped about, and I have never been mo more amped than I am right now to get it to get back into that mm. on a consistent pl to, to to reside in the moment again in a consistent way is the most exciting thing going on. And if the secret to life is living to your highest excitement with zero expectations of the outcome, all I know is that my highest excitement is to get back into the moment. I'll have what she's having. And listen, <laughs> listen, um, a reminder uh, as we end um, what Buddy said, which is um, always a, a reminder because we are scattered constantly and it is a practice to, you know, get back to the here and now um, where life lives. Uh, what's the reminder, Buddy? I was going to say something about dads. but maybe The moment not. where life lives, where life lives. All I can think about is the moment. And if we're bringing it back to dads, I just know that being a good one, having a good one is, is, uh, is a special thing. And, uh, if you've got one, if you are one, if there's anything you can do to help each other get back to, to, to stay in the moment, to be present and have honest conversations with each other, it is not a missed it is not a missed opportunity in any way than fear fact that you're putting effort into it. It, it, it somehow fundamentally in some somewhere in the fore or background instills a love in just the try. So try. Some people don't even try. Yeah. Yeah. We need more present fathers in this world. And if you're uh, listening to this past this as someone who is trying and being a good dad, because uh, a lot of good dads don't get that reminder or even appreciation, you know, and so um, they, they they need to hear that um, they're doing good. You know, I I want to say that I've done that, that I've done that. As an example, I've done that. And and with regards to You've the man who picked what? up. You've done what? With regards yeah. to the man who picked up his portly boy in front of the mindset and uh -huh. and uh, uh, that t to walk up to him and say, do you know what, man? You're doing great. Mm. My dad never even did that once. You can't yeah. imagine. It's like cleaning a house. It's like cleaning a house in every detail and people walking in. Maybe they notice it's a clean house, but that's it. And they move on. If they walk into your house and it's just shit, they notice, they tell everyone. It's just, they, 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 that's how they see you. But go up when you notice and tell a person, yeah. father, a mother, how good they're doing because yeah, they interesting. probably don't you, you, all that for the city stuff sometimes yeah you haven't said anything to me and i'm a father but anyway uh let me end with a quick story i was at a coffee shop the other day and uh this just happened so let me just end with this um a, a dad was with his toddler and um he spilled the entire thing of milk all over the the floor of the coffee shop the dad turned around and i braced myself because i was like oh shit this dad's gonna smack his child um and my, i was with my child and the dad turned around and said it's okay hey it's okay and the child was like oh my god what, what's gonna happen to me and he's like it's okay it's okay scooped up the child grabbed the rag whatever and then when they passed by me i said hey man you're a kind dad and i hope he knew that i meant it sincerely and and he was shocked, like like he's never heard that. He was very surprised that I said that. Uh, but I said that. And uh, anyway, that that that's my story of your mindset story. Uh, just because Good. we're very com very competitive. Everybody do that. T yeah. Assignment. Do it. Compliment a parent that you don't know when you see them doing something awesome in public because it's gonna make their fucking day.
Yeah, it's a big deal. Thank you for listening, everyone. Be well. Bye.